seven if you want to follow along. and sisters, I, I just wanted to say a few things before I even get into the presentation. What an awesome week this has been. Amen? Amen. Have you been blessed? Amen. I'm going to tell you that um, I praise the Lord for Michael Woodward's presentation. You know, he said, I was just sure you were going to steal my thunder. <laughs> right? Well, I'm not going to steal your thunder, Michael. Uh, I didn't in the first presentation. I'm not in this one, but I really appreciated. Um, and I want to reiterate something that was in your presentation. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 19 and 20. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? And you know, some Christians interpret that to say that you can take it or leave it. Whatever you want to do is okay. But the next verse says, But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. And folks, I don't want to be any part of anything that is sacrificed to devils. And so I praise the Lord for Michael's presentation. It's getting me ready for what we're going to talk about today. And I praise the Lord for Daniel Mesa's second presentation. And folks, all of the presentations have been good, but I'm picking these because they have something to do with what we're talking about here. You know, we as speakers, we prepare what we're going to have based on 
basically one Bible verse, and we don't know if we're all going to step on each other's presentations or if we're going to blend harmoniously to make a great camp meeting. And praise the Lord, that's God's spirit that makes that happen, isn't it? But I praise the Lord for Daniel Mesa's second presentation. And uh, you had mentioned at one point in there, you quoted the guy about impersonating the apostles. And I was out there thinking, I know this may not be the full fulfillment of it, but I was thinking as you were talking, they're already, they've already done that. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to the Vatican, if you go to St. Peter's Basilica, there's a statue of Zeus, mm -hmm. and the people bow down and worship the, statu the statue thinking that it's Peter. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And what about all the medallions that people wear? They talk about patron saints. Mm -hmm. Is... is it really Peter and Paul and James and John and even St. Francis of Assisi, are they really what is being focused on in these things? And it's not. I assure you it's not. It's the same old hundred or more gods that were worshipped back there in Babylon. And of course that was what my first presentation was about. But folks, then there was Pastor Allen's presentation on holiness. Mm -hmm. And that one was so awesome. That is exactly what we need. Yeah. But one of the things he told us is that you cannot have sin and righteousness or holiness to coexist. Amen. It just doesn't work that way. But folks, even the churches that call themselves Christian and it... You know, even the Seventh-day Adventist church, they're finding ways that we do just exactly that. We're, just like in the days of Babylon, we're mixing the sacred and we're mixing the common or the unclean, aren't we? And that just doesn't work. And then, of course, I can't ignore the presentation this morning from Sister Annika. Oh, I, you know, it was kind of a blur she did it so fast. But I think it was really the best presentation we've had. Oh, it was, it was just glorious to me. I really appreciated it. Well, one other thing I wanted to mention. I was excited to meet um, Isaac and his wife. And, you know, years and years ago, I knew her family. And it never occurred to me when I was talking to you that I may have known you when you were just a little tiny thing. But uh, it's hard to put all those pieces together, but I knew her mother, I knew her uncle, and I knew her grandfather. And as I was asking, I really re rushed back there because I wanted to know, was Calvin Dent, because I love the man, was he a part of this movement? Was he a part of this message? And she's shaking her head, yes. But the way she answered me is what I want to get to. She said, well, you know, they were just Adventists back there. They were old-time Adventists, Amen. and it wasn't a movement to them. It's what Adventism was and always had been. Amen. And I really like that because, folks, I want to give you an old-timey Adventist sermon today. And you might laugh at that when you see what I'm presenting. And again, I'm going to say, I hope... I hope that I am preaching to the choir. I hope this is like Sister Annika said, just practice. Nothing new, really, okay? But it is something that is near and dear to my heart, and it's something that I don't hear really anybody talking about. Wonder what I did. There it is. Okay. I really don't hear people talking about. My first presentation was Babylon, right? We're talking about ancient Babylon. And, of course, I told you in that presentation that I believe that the tie between Babylon and Rome, and both of those symbols are used in the book of Revelation for the last days, right? Babylon is where all the false religions of the world began. Mm -hmm. All the paganism comes from Babylon. And I believe Rome is where they have all settled for the last great conflict, mm -hmm. the last day. So that's the tie between Babylon and Rome. And our study today is from Babylon to Rome. 
And so, I want to go first to the book of Ezekiel. In fact, most of our study today will be in the book of Ezekiel. And I've kind of got the same problem that Sister Annika had. So I'm going to go fast, <laughs> okay? But praise the Lord, we have the technology to keep up with all these things. Folks, we study and talk and preach about the Revelation and Daniel. And that's good. And we know these two prophetic books go together. A little like the old song. You ever, you ever heard that old song, you can't have one without the other? Yes? Are we going to pray again? Please? Thank you. Thank you, sister, because I had that in mind. I wanted to do my little introduction first and then pray. So thank you so very much for that. Let us kneel as, we, as far as possible. I get excited and get going. Dear Heavenly Father, oh, please don't ever let us open your word without lifting our hearts up in prayer and praise to you. We are so thankful for the Bible and the great change that it has made in our lives because it shows us who Jesus really is, the way, the truth, and the life. And I just ask you today, Lord, to take these things that we're looking at in your word and make them come alive for us in these last days of earth's history and teach us what we should be doing. In Jesus' holy name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for that. Because I really didn't want to miss that. The books of Daniel and Revelation, the old song was, you can't have one without the other. And they go together. You cannot understand the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel. You cannot really understand the book of Daniel without some help from Revelation. Praise the Lord, we have them both now. Yes. Daniel didn't. But uh, something else that I always have to say with that is you can't understand either one of them without the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It's all about the sanctuary. But if you had to pick the next book that lines up with these last day prophecies, I think a good one would be Ezekiel. Of course, Isaiah would be good as well. But I want to start in the book of Ezekiel. If we could study the whole book of Ezekiel here today, I just want to tell you really quickly, chapter 1 is about the throne of God and the holiness of His kingdom. Chapter 2 addresses the sins of God's professed people. Chapter 3 is about God's warning against their apostasy, and He calls them to repent, even though He says right there in the chapter that they're not going to repent. He tells Ezekiel that ahead of time. And I believe this is just about where we are at today, brothers and sisters. Almost all of the churches of our land, including the Seventh-day Adventist organized church are in apostasy. Preach. Okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter 4. Ezekiel is told to come against the city of Jerusalem and to lay siege upon the city. And folks, you want to bring it up to date? That could easily be the general conference headquarters. Could it not? Yes. Chapter 5 says that because they had defiled his sanctuary with detestable things and abominations, he would diminish and destroy. What was the promise to Abraham about his children? He's going to make them a great nation. Well, right here he says, because of these detestable things and idols, he's going to diminish them and even destroy them because of these abominations. Chapter 6 and 7 is all about the judgments that will fall upon them. Chapter 8 is about what the abominations are mm -hmm. that, have, that they have committed. Mm -hmm. Chapter 9 is about the mark of God mm -hmm. and the judgment of the church that is based upon the sanctuary message. Remember, they are measured according to the sanctuary and the great slaughter that starts with God's people and the elders especially the elders, the leadership of his professed church, right? Mm -hmm. We all know those things. So what I want to look at today is what are these abominations mm -hmm. that are being done in Ezekiel 8 mm -hmm. as well as today. 
that will bring about this great slaughter. We don't want to be a part of the slaughter, do we? No. Well, the obvious message of Ezekiel, the message of God through Ezekiel, is to stay away from these abominations so that we won't suffer in this slaughter that's being talked about in chapter 9. And that's what I want to delve into to today. In Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 1, it says there, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, and in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Now, God gives his prophets a message for the church, and he has the elders of the church sitting right there in front of him. That's an amazing situation, isn't it? Ezekiel says that as he sat in his house with the elders of Judah before him, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon him. And then in verse 2 it says, Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. Folks, one of my favorite subjects, I talked about two years ago when we were here. It's the glory of God. It is by far one of my favorite subjects in the Bible, and it has so much to teach us. But if we compare this verse with the book of Daniel and Revelation, we will know that this is the Son of God that appears to Ezekiel in this vision. Who is likened unto a consuming fire? God is. The Father first, but of course He gives everything to the Son, so could we say that same thing about Jesus? But we still want to pause to remember where did it come from? Who had it first? The source of all. God our Father. Amen. So the best way I can say this is that the Son of God in the glory of His Father. But again, it is the glory of God that all these bright and shining fire-like descriptions are pointing us to. And you see basically the exact same descriptions used in Revelation chapter 1 and Daniel chapter 10. And so it really fits these prophetic messages together. All right, verse 3 says, And he put forth the form of an hand, and took me by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now that's a lot of words. That's hard to read. But when you read it, where are we at? Again, Jerusalem, General Conference Headquarters, right? And where specifically in Jerusalem are we? At the temple complex. That's exactly right. So, we're at the temple of the living God, but it is talking about the seat of the image of jealousy. And that, folks, is disturbing, isn't it? What was built in Jerusalem should have been the opposite of this image of jealousy, right? The image of jealousy were these other nations around them. Not supposed to be in Israel. They were the light of the world that was going to show the truth to everybody. But apparently that's not the case at this time in Israel's history. What is the image of the seat of jealousy? And I'm telling you... If we did a good Bible study on that and spent our time, we could spend an hour or two today talking about that. But I want to, for sake of time, go to a very simple answer to this question. It's found in Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 5. Anything special about Exodus 20? That's the Ten Commandments. And so look what it says there. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen? Amen. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above 
or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, and thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. Don't make them first. Mm -hmm. If you don't make the gods, you're not going to be tempted to worship the gods, mm -hmm. right? Amen. I think there's something we could draw out of that for a lesson in our lives here today. Because like we heard in one of the earlier presentations, we need to get the temptation out of our midst, don't we? Amen. We are talking about those cigarettes, if you remember. Well, it says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. The seat of the image of jealousy. What image is being discussed here? It's the images that they made of these false gods and they worshipped, right? The graven image. The idols. Where did all the idols come from? You know, our first presentation was all about that. Where do all the false religions come from? Babylon. Babylon. Ancient Babylon, even going all the way back to what the Bible calls Babel, which is no different from Babylon. It's the exact same word, the exact same place. So, God says very plainly that he is a jealous God. So the seat of the image of jealousy has to do with this idol worship, which began in Babylon and ends up where? <laughs> well, it ends up in Rome, but on the way, where has it gone? It has gone to Jerusalem, no doubt. In God's holy city, it also appears. All right, verse 4 in Ezekiel 8 says, And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. The fire and the brightness and the color of amber all bespeak the literal glory of God here in this vision that was given to Ezekiel. But we also know that spiritually the glory of God is symbolic of something. It's the character of God. The glory of God represents the character of God. So the glory of a man is going to be his character. And what are we supposed to fashion our character after? <coughs> what God intended in the first place, which was His perfect image, His perfect glory. And so, He gave the nation of Israel to be the light of the world in Old Testament times, but what did they do? Now, I just want to give you one simple answer to this. Don't turn there. Just write it down and look at it later. Chapter 5 of Ezekiel actually says that they changed the judgments of God into wickedness. Now reason with me. What are the judgments of God? It's His commandments. That's exactly right. And there are places in the Bible where it says my statutes, my judgments, my commandments, those kind of things, those kind of statements. What are the Ten Commandments? Well, one, one answer to that is a transcript of God's holy character, right? So, what is it really talking about here? Instead of truly being the light of the world, that's what he sent them to do, they changed the character of God into wickedness. And you find that in Ezekiel 5, verse 6. Because the way that they were to show God's character to the world was how? How were they to be a light to the world? I know we, we spread the gospel. That's the light, and we spread that to the world. But there's something more important than telling the people. We have to live it, don't we? We have to live this message, or else we're never going to be able to share it with others. They lived out what, though? They turned the judgments of God into wickedness. So what kind of lives were they living? Wickedness, that's right. God had given them, them his glory, but what did they do with it? Very, very sad. Look at verse 5. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up my, thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes 
the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the, the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. Is there any question that we're at the temple in Jerusalem? I mean, we understand the language here. At the very door. At the very door, amen. He sees this image of jealousy. Where does he see it? Jerusalem. Where in Jerusalem? It's the gate northward. It's the temple grounds. And you know, in the temple, there's one thing that was on the north side of anything in the temple. Do you know what it was? The table of showbread. Do you know what the table of showbread represented? God's throne. That's absolutely right. A lot of Christians want to say Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, so he went right into the most holy place. And that's not right. You have to take it to the sanctuary. You have to understand the whole process. Jesus left this world after he did the outer court part. He leaves this world. He goes to the first apartment. And there had to be a throne there, didn't there? Yeah. And he stood on the right hand of the throne, which is his official reason for being there, was the altar of incense. He was the intercessory priest yes. at this point. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a beautiful picture that is being created for us here. All right. Now, what do we see in this picture in verse 5 here? It says, at the gate of the, of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. And then in verse 6 it says, He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go off far, go far off from my sanctuary. Mm -hmm. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. Mm -hmm. Now, it does not yet tell us what it is talking about here, but it tells us something very important, some things that are very important. Mm -hmm. There are great abominations, mm -hmm. but there are going to be greater, greater. greater abominations. And the thing about these abominations, most important thing of all, is that they drive God far off from his sanctuary. Mm -hmm. What was the purpose for the building? His presence. His presence. It was a house for God to dwell with his people. The abomination of desolation. Absolutely the abomination of desolation. Folks, it's a hard concept for some people to take in, but the Bible is clear on this subject. There are many churches in our land that God cannot attend. Mm -hmm. Many churches where God cannot attend. Well, oh, thank you. I didn't know I had done it. I'm no, so no, that's, that's the wrong course. Thank you. I'm so rambunctious. Please forgive me. All right. So, these abominations drive off God, and the purpose for the house is for God to dwell with his people. So, if we drive God far off, what's the purpose? I mean, it's a lot of trouble to do these things. The Bible even says they were contrary to us. They were against us. In other words, it was a pain to do these things. So why go through the motions if you're not going to have the reward at the end, which is having God dwell with you? Amen. But then he says, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. All right? Verse 7 then says, And he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Now I hope you're getting the picture here, because it is a picture for us. God said, Because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your abominations, and that's what we're looking at here is these abominations, and yet greater abominations. So, we're here at the door of the outer court. What does the door of the outer court represent? The door of Jesus. 
the door. Jesus is the door, isn't he? He is the only way to the Father. John 10 tells us, and it's actually using the sheep fold there, but it tells us that Jesus is the door, and if you try to go any other way, what are you? A thief and a robber. That's exactly right. And so now we've got the door to the court, and he sees maybe a tiny little hole in the wall. Okay? And look at what it says in verse 8. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, what did he find? A door. A door. He brings Ezekiel to the door of the outer court. He tells him to dig in the wall. And when he digs, he discovers a door. A secret door, if you will. Now remember, the sanctuary is all about symbolism. Jesus is the door. There can only be one door, only one way to the Father. But he finds another door. So what would that represent in the symbology here? Another Jesus. Another way. Another way to the Father. Amen. So if you try to come another way, what are you? Thief and a robber. So what were they? According to this prophecy. Verse 9. And he said unto me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. Ezekiel's told to actually go through the secret door and see what they are doing in the very sanctuary of God. And this is showing us that the leadership of God's professed church is saying and showing one thing and they're doing something else, aren't they? So, what are they doing here? It's called abominations, isn't it? That's a very, very strong word. All sin is not called abomination in the Bible. There's certain sins that God does call an abomination. Verse 10, So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable, be abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Now, there were not any pictures or statues that represented God. That would be image worship, wouldn't it? But we're going into this secret room in the temple complex, and what are we finding? Creeping things, abominable beasts, and idols, and they were. that. What would make a beast abominable? Unclean. It has to be unclean. That's exactly right. The of the Gentiles. Now, forgive me, but I've included a lot of dirty pictures in this presentation, okay? And these are not the things that we want to focus ourselves on, but just for the sake of information, I just want to show you a few pictures. If you were to go into a pagan temple during these ancient times, what would you see? And we can know the answer to that question. Just Google it. It will show you. There's all kinds of detestable, abominable beast and the icons and the um, symbols. Do we have symbols today? Yeah. I mean, more than ever, the symbols have taken over our world, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, everybody has the symbols. And I'm just going to go through them very quickly, but I brought a few pictures to show what the ancient paganism looked like if you went into their temples. And these pictures, um, there's just an awful lot of clutter on the walls, aren't there? And we probably don't even know what it all is, and I don't care to find out. But does it sound like the description that we see in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8 here? Does this look similar to what we just read? And I say it really does. Here is, this is a drawing, but it's a drawing of an actual thing that is in the British Museum. And the, the pictures were grainy and you couldn't really see. But that was, you know, had something to do with this pagan worship all uh, back during that time. Now, what about today? I couldn't resist giving you one more picture. This picture I just found on Google. I don't know what the story is behind it, but it's somebody's. Looks like a master bedroom. Looks like the master bed. 
and it looks like they've got their master on the wall, doesn't it? Do you know any? Do you recognize any of those symbols? And they're all religious, aren't they? They all have to do with paganism. Well, I got to get going. Number eleven, verse eleven. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jaazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Folks, who are the ancients of the house of Israel? The That's the elders. That's the leadership, isn't it? The, and... What about these guys? They've got censers in their hands. What does that tell us? It's the priesthood. It's the priest of the temple. So who do you think is going to be behind all these abominations that we're talking about? I mean, that's exactly it, isn't it? And the last thing it says there is that a thick cloud of incense is going up. And what does that tell us? They're all worshiping, okay? We didn't just find the evidence of where something happened one time. They're doing it, aren't they? They are doing it. The very ministers of God's sanctuary are taking part in this false and pagan worship. Verse 12, and Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? every man in the chambers of his imagery, for they say, the Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Folks, what do they do in the dark? What do they do in the secret? What do they do in the chambers of imagery? Their imaginations. Folks, all three of those point us to evil. When the Bible talks about those things, most of the time we're talking about things that are done secretly or in the dark or in, you know, the secret parts of our brain, it's evil, isn't it? And so, the imagination, the imagery, you know, think about it, image worship, imagination, it's the same root to those things, isn't it? And worst of all, they say the Lord is gone and He doesn't see what we're doing here. Well. I, you know, I have to agree, the Lord was gone mm -hmm. because they drove him off. He said it himself, right? But does that mean God can't see? <laughs> if we were to be wicked and God couldn't come to our meeting here, does that mean he doesn't see what we're doing in our wickedness? No way. Verse 13, He said unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. How could there be greater abominations? Well, look at verse 14. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. But for the sake of the presentation, who is this Tammuz? And why were women weeping for him? And I know you all know the answer to this, but I just scarfed up a few pictures off the internet. None of these were done by me. So we're doing, we're doing uh, pictures that acknowledge the fact that somebody besides me believes this. <laughs> okay? But this old cartoon I've had for years, it is... The representation of Semiramis Nimrod and, of course, Tamu was supposedly their miracle child. And you know this is the original pagan trinity. And it, was, and it was supposed to counterfeit or mirror, kind of, the Father and the Son, right, and the Holy Spirit. You know which one they pick for the Holy Spirit? Semiramis. You know who really started this whole uh, deceitful religion? Semiramis. Semiramis. It really wasn't Nimrod. He kind of he gets mentioned first, but he really didn't have much to do with this. He was dead and gone when it, right. when it all started. Right. Yes, sir? Wasn't it he died and then she said that he, he Ab came back that's right. to her? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, this is the original pagan trinity, and Tammuz was supposed to be a miracle child that happened after there was no father there. You know, he was an illegitimate child. Right. 
Okay, no, no doubt about that. But she makes the story up that it's a miraculous birth. And what, what's that trying to do? It's trying to, to uh, imitate or counterfeit the virgin birth. That's exactly right. This is an ancient relief of Tammuz that's in the British Museum. And I like this picture because it shows he is wearing a cross on his chest. He has, you can see in the picture, there is a chain around his neck and the cross on his chest. And if you go from Babylon to Rome, are the crosses on the chest a big part of it? I mean, it just makes it really easy to see. And I like this slide. It says it's all Tammuz. It doesn't matter which one of these crosses you see. The whole point to a cross is the letter. Actually, we say T, but in the Greek it was tau. It really was the letter T, but they called it tau. And so however you dress up the T, it has to do with worshiping this original pagan trinity. And yes, where did it come from? Babylon. This is just one I scarfed off of somebody's website, and it's showing that Lent, you know, Easter happens if, if you know about Catholicism, and I've never been a Catholic, but I have studied it, and hopefully I don't mess it up when I say that the Lent season, Easter is one part of the Lent season, like Christmas is one part of the Advent season. But anyway, you read it down below, the 40 days of Lent symbolizes the 40 years that Tammuz lived. And so when they weep for Tammuz, what is it pointing us to? Well, it's pointing us to the ancient pagan practice of Tammuz. But again, what happens, where is it at today? Where is it most prominently at today? Catholicism, that's exactly right. And this is just another picture that I got off of the internet. Okay, so Ezekiel sees this. This is a part, an integral part of the pagan worship. And it is still a part of the pagan worship even though it's been Christianized. It's been, we, you know, Joe Cruz used to call it baptized, Christian, or baptized paganism. That's right. And, uh, uh, absolutely. So verse 15 says, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. Verse 16, And he brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord between the porch and the altar were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. Now, in the very temple of God, the leadership here, and by the way, this is a different count, and it's a different group of men. The others were priests, right? These aren't priests. These are the other leadership, like, you know, the, uh, the uh, apostles kind of leadership in the church. Yeah, the general conference again, that's right. And so that tells us something very interesting. If you go one place, you find the priesthood, and what are they doing? Paganism. If you go to another place and you find another group of leadership men, what are they doing? So it's not an isolated thing. It's like Isaiah says, the whole head is sick, right? And it says that this leadership, this group of 25 men, the leadership, turned their backs on the temple of the Lord. And that means they have turned their backs on the sanctuary message. Does that resonate with anybody here today? Yeah. Folks, which way is up? <laughs> do we know the answer to that question? And I'm saying yes, we do. Everything in God's sanctuary was symbolic and we've already said it but the only thing on the north side of that sanctuary was the table of showbread it was the throne of the living god and it was set up north south east and west particularly so that 
to worship the true and living God, you had to come from the east and you had to work your way west. And I know the people did not go into the sanctuary building, but in their spiritual lives they did. Yes. Where are we supposed to be right now? In the, most holy place. in the most holy place with Jesus. That's right. And so, as you go through the sanctuary, you start in the east and you go to the west. And so there's a reason for that. And it gives it away in this. It says they turned their back on the sanctuary, they faced the east where the rising sun was because the ancient pagan sun worshipers, especially the most holy part of the sun worship, was when the sun was rising. Okay, They did worship three parts of the day, but the most holy of all was sunrise. That's exactly right. And so, in order to reject God and worship the sun, what do we have to do? I mean, we literally turn our backs on God, don't we? And that's just fascinating to me. Well, do we have anything like that in our day? And you know, before I showed you ancient pictures of pagan temples, this is not so ancient, is it? We have these things going on in our world every Easter Sunday. And what about Adventist churches? Surely we don't do this stuff. <laughs> Folks, the Ishtar sunrise service is widely practiced in the Seventh-day Adventist church today, as is Easter services. Even if it's the day before Easter, we usually do something special to talk about Easter, don't we? I mean, in our churches. <clears throat> and what does God call this? Abomination. An abomination. Amen. How did Sunday get its name? You know, you don't have to wait for Easter to come, do you? Every week we worship the sun on the venerable day of the sun. That's how Sunday got its name. It is the first day of the week because it was the first God in the multiplicity of, that is paganism. What the Bible calls God's a many, right? In fact, that's also how the planets got their names. And I just put that up as a background because all of our planets are named after these um, gods, these pagan gods, false gods. And I just use that for a background to put this up there. The days of the week are all named after these pagan gods. Here's one. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrates and people residing in cities rest and let all workshops be closed. You know, that's the Roman Emperor Constantine in A.D. 321. This little slide here is the word venerate because a lot of people say venerate is something different than worshiping. But when you look it up in the dictionary, now the word was actually created so that they could say venerate and not worship and sidetrack the fact that they are worshiping the saints and they're worshiping the mother of God and all these kind of things. But you don't have to look very far to know that it's really just another way of saying worship, isn't it? And then, of course, you all know what about the IHS. Isis, Horus, and Set, and the sun burst there. And what do you think this relic comes to us from? <laughs> Catholicism is what I was looking for there, but you're, you're right. All right. Now, I actually want to read this, and I have to get over here to do it because it's too small on my screen. I just got this from somebody else off of the internet, but it's interesting. The pagans believe that their sun god is conceived on 321, the spring equinox. You can see this played out annually at the Vatican. That's a picture of St. Saint uh, Saint Peter's Basilica in Vatican City. And you know what that obelisk is there for. They got a good picture because it shows the shadow falling. And it's like a sundial, but it's not an hourly sundial. It's a yearly sundial. 
And it points to when these important pagan holidays begin. And so it's just really, really interesting. And I won't read all the rest of it, but you see it says nine months later their son Tammuz is born. The pagans believe that on the winter solstice, 1221, and that's where it all comes from. And I just quickly want to throw some pictures up here. The pagan holidays, this, I wanted to put this up because today paganism is still alive and well. They call it pagan. They call it Wiccan. They have other names for it. Mm -hmm. And this is something from their website to show what the pagan holidays are. And the winter solstice and the autumn equinox and the, the uh, spring, the vernal equinox, all of that shows that these seasons have everything to do with their worship. They're worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. Mm -hmm. And so these... these uh, these uh, seasons are very important to it. But I also want to show you, if you look close enough, and I've got another slide that makes it even clearer. It's a little more user-friendly. The Pagan Witch's Wheel of the Year. Yule. What is Yule? It's Christmas. Uh, in bulk may not look all that familiar to you if you're not Catholic. But Ostara is Easter, and then, of course, May Day. We've heard of it, even though it's not so prevalent in this country outside of Catholicism. Yeah. But you can go right on around, and you even see Halloween up there. And, and you guys know Halloween is not just a pagan holiday. It's a Christian. It's a Catholic holiday. It's the eve before All Saints Day, and I'm told that is the most important day of the year. Okay? All Saints Day. And so, but what I want you to get from this is that when you come into Catholicism, they use wheels that are very much like this, and they have some of the same exact names. Notice Sam Hain, where on the other one it said Halloween which is October 31st. On this one, it says Sam Hain, the 1st of November, the new year. What's it talking about? All Saints Day. Okay? But the pagan and the Christian are exactly alike. They've just changed the names. Like Joe Cruz said, they've just baptized the paganism, right? <laughs> And, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it, but I know you have a favorite symbol there in the middle, <laughs> right? We know what that is. That's the, the, and you know, the Catholic Church teaches that the Trinity is the first and foremost doctrine from which they get everything else. So wouldn't it be in the middle of the wheel? It would be the spokes. Now, how many times have you heard good preachers use a wheel to represent unity? And you say, if you've got Jesus in the middle, every spoke goes to Jesus. There's going to be perfect unity, right? So who's in the middle of their wheel? God forbid. This one directly from a Catholic site. And that's, it's, it's just another form of the exact same thing. Paganism is still alive and well in Catholicism. All right, this one I just couldn't resist. I'm not going to go through it. You can just look at it. Silly Christian. Christmas was the winter solstice. Easter was the spring equinox and, and goes on and on. And the, the conclusion of this slide is your calendar is pagan. Who gave us our calendar, by the way? Rome. Rome. That's exactly right. Who gave us our watch? I mean, you know, the way, the way things are reckoned. Jeremiah 7.18. I'm going to leave Ezekiel, and I want to go to Jeremiah 7.18. And, and I'm going to try to wrap this up in just a few minutes. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Who is the queen of heaven? Well, don't answer that. Because we don't have enough time to answer it. Because the queen of heaven originally was Semiramis. I really want to back up on that. The queen of heaven originally was Satan. Yes. Amen? Yes. You know, we talk about the false gods and the gods of many that it talks about in the Bible, but really and truly it's the female goddess that 
brought all this to us. That's what Satan used to bring all this to us. But it's Semiramis, it's Isis, it's Venus, it's all of these different names. But where do you think it settles today? The majority of the world. I mean, even Muslims and Buddhists and uh, Hindus, they will tell you the Queen of God is who? Mary. Mary. Okay? So, she's mentioned five times in the book of Jeremiah in all of these verses. In one way or another, they are worshiping her. And I'm not going to go through all of my notes on this because we've got to get through here. But folks, the queen of heaven in Jeremiah 44, 18, it says, well, in uh, Jeremiah 7, 18, it says we make cakes to the queen of heaven. In Jeremiah 44, 18, it says we burn incense to the queen of heaven. And do we find this still being done today? You know, we can take the Bible's word for it that it was being done in ancient times for Semiramis. But who is it being done for today? That's a neat little picture that I didn't make either. But it shows how uh, Semiramis has come down through all of these other uh, times. And is she present here today? Look at that. Got the Statue of Liberty. You've got the movie lady. I can't remember which brand that is. But what about Starbucks? <laughs> You know, we pulled up right next to a Starbucks sign the other day, and my wife goes, who is that really supposed to be? It's a fish with two tails. <laughs> but look at this book, Our Beautiful Queen. Who is the Queen of Heaven? It's supposed to be Mary. And what do they call Mary? The Mother of God. What an abomination. What an abomination. Now, these two pictures, the reason I've got that up there is because one of those statues was made to be Semiramis. Mm -hmm. And one of those statues was made to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. How close are they? I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, isn't it? And of course, do they pour out drink offerings to the Queen of Heaven? Do they burn incense to the Queen of Heaven? Do they make cakes? to the Queen of Heaven. And why a cross? Because of the cross of Christ? Remember, it's all about Tammuz. That, they don't even call that a cross. They call it the Tau. Catholicism calls it the Tau. And they worship the letter T. Jeremiah 10, 3-5. For the customs of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but they speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Folks, all of the false gods are dead, aren't they? We serve the one living God. Amen? But, and, you, and I know the scholars argue about this Bible verse. They say it really wasn't talking about Christmas trees. And I know that it's really not talking about Christmas trees the way we have them now, but are Christmas trees an idol? So is it talking about idols? Absolutely it is. And you know... Just some old pictures. I'm not going to spend time on them. We've got, to, we've got to end. But you can see where it comes from, can't you? I mean, it's so very obvious. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what are those? Look at verse 3. Forbidding to marry. Who is it that forbids to marry? Now, the ancient pagans did that, and therefore there are some other Eastern religions you know, that are openly pagan, and they do that. But who in our sphere of the world does this? I mean, professed Christians. That's a good way to put it. Catholicism, right? And what about the abstaining from meats? Do they do that? 
You know about Lent, Fish Fridays, and all that stuff. Couple more pictures. You know what that is? It's a rosary, okay? What about the rosary beads? Where did they get that? From paganism. Do you remember the Bible telling us to pray the rosary? <laughs> what is that verse? What does the Bible tell us about praying the rosary? Well, I'll show you. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. I, I may mess this up, but if you look at the rosary beads, it's like 53 or 57. It, it's a lot of prayers. And, and sometimes, well, there's five decades, and I know there's 50, but there's a lot of our fathers and, and um, apostles' creeds and all that stuff in between. And, you know, you might be given the task of saying five of these rosary prayers. That doesn't mean five times. That means five times the 50-something because you're doing penance for your sin. What does Jesus say about this? Don't be like this. Don't do it like the heathen do. Who does it? It was the pagans. It was the Babylonians that did this. But we've baptized it and we call it Christianity. You know what this is? Well, you can read. It's a Wiccan goddess rosary. Not only do they share the same calendar wheel of these holidays and these, these worship things, they have the same rosary beads. I mean, they're almost identical if you, sh if you compare them. There's very few differences. In the decades, they call them, that means 10. What do they do in the decades? Can you read it? It's Hail Marys. Why would the pagans be saying Hail Marys? Because it's pagan. They had it before Catholicism had it, right? You know, 1 Kings 18, 21, we, we probably know it by heart. How long halt you between two opinions? If, if God be God, then serve Him. If Baal be God, then serve Him. In other words, you can't ride the fence. And you cannot truly worship both, even though that's what Catholicism is doing. And of course, Joshua 24, 15 is the same way. If it, if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, what? We will worship the Lord. Now, I want to end it this way. That is a very old picture. I wish I could find an updated version of it. I wish I was smart enough to make an updated version of it. But this is a very old picture, but I love this picture. I love this picture. And what we're talking about today boils down to this old picture again. And you say, well, you've preached a good Adventist sermon because you've bashed the pagans and you've bashed the Catholics. <laughs> Okay? Well, yeah, we, we, we have to go on to the apostate Protestants because we talked about Adventists too, didn't we? Absolutely. But that's not really what this is all about because I hope we don't have any pagans in, in this room and I hope we don't have any Catholics in this room. I was. Well, praise the Lord, but you're not now. So why would I preach this sermon and, and we all believe the same way. And we all, the only reason that I would do this is that some of these hideous things that we've talked about here today have come to our churches. Okay? And we look at these things. People look at Halloween, oh, it's just like cartoonish fun for children. Not a big deal. You, you just get so carried away with this stuff. It's not a big deal. Remember where we started in the book of Ezekiel where he's telling us if we do these things, they're abominations and we're going to be lost. I don't know but what come Christmas time, you know, I've known, I've known Adventists that wouldn't put up a Christmas tree, but during Christmas time, they would put the candle in the window 
or they would put the garland on the door, the wreath on the door, and, and we reason with ourselves that we want to meet the people and we want to share the truth with them. But I'm telling you, I don't want to take one step toward these doctrines of devils to try to impress anybody or even win them to the truth. Because if we do that, what have we won? We've just become like the rest of them and we've just decided to do it along with them. And like baptized paganism, we can say, well, I don't believe that. I think it means this. And you'll hear people, they'll say, well, I think, it, I think this is what I believe. This is what I'm after. You know, we have to be Bereans, don't we? We have to do that. And I didn't come here today to hurt anybody's feelings. But this is something that I believe is going to keep some of our people out of the kingdom of God. And therefore, I think it needs to be said. And I really haven't heard anybody talking about it in a long, long time. So I appreciate your attention. Folks, this picture, just let me say this, this picture is all about what are we going to do? Where are we going to stand? See, this little group of people are standing with Jesus on the Bible. Amen? Amen? And Jesus is standing in the rocks, the mountains. I think that's symbolic too because where are these great cathedrals put? In clouds. What's the stability of clouds? So we have a choice to make. Are we going to be with the little group that stands with Jesus on the Bible or are we going to be part of the big group that stands with church tradition, or stands with the church on tradition, the book of tradition. And folks, there's actually one more way of looking at this, and I was supposed to put up a question mark. There's one more way of looking at this. That, who's that standing on the Bible? Christ. So who's that standing over here on this? Listen, listen. If that's Christ, this is antichrist. Which are we going to be a part of? And, and, and here's the biggest question of all. Don't the people in the church ask you about the one true God movement? What does it really matter? Why do you make such a big deal out of this? God's not concerned with all this stuff. And I believe He is. And I believe it could be our very salvation. Thank you, Pastor Allen. So let's have a closing prayer. And again, for those folks online, we will be back at 2 o'clock, not at 1.30. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you want to help us, that you have a great interest in us, and that you want us to have a pure faith. You want us to have a faith that rightly represents you and not Satan and his things. And we pray that you will bless the truths that we've heard today and help them to sink deep into our hearts. We pray that we might uh, purify our flesh and our spirit of all filthiness and that we might live totally for you. Father, I'm going to go ahead and ask a blessing upon the food that we're going to be receiving here in just a little bit. We thank you for uh, the good sisters and a few brothers also that were gracious to help out to prepare it and as they set it out that it will be ready and, and best for us and we can be back at 2 o'clock. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.